Swami ji, you can unmute and start, sir. Right. Namaste. Good evening, everybody. When we look at our suffering, especially our fears and anxieties, we can easily see that thoughts of certain kind are much involved. It is in the medium of particular thoughts and generally we think of suppressing those thoughts. Somebody is unable to get sleep even though it is 1 a.m., 2 a.m., some fear of what could happen the next day, what could happen in the next six months, etc., makes him or her lose sleep, unable to sleep. Though the bedroom is wonderful, the temperature is great, the comfort is excellent, yet this man is unable to sleep. Why? The machine called the mind is continuously creating pictures of disaster. I will lose all my money. I may even be arrested. I will be in the bad books of so many people who have lent money to me and I am unable to return their money to them. So you find thoughts are flowing and in those thoughts, on one hand, there are pictures of what had happened and then there are pictures of what might happen. And as I illustrated, all these thoughts do have a notion of I who will be in deep trouble. I will be insulted. I have to meet with such infamy. I don't know whether I can show my face to people if this kind of financial loss takes place, etc. That's how the thoughts run. It could be, of course, financial loss or the failure of some project or some relationship to which you are clinging, but the other side wants to walk out of that relationship. So, very notably, there is picture and picture of what could happen, scenario of what could happen, and there is the sense of I that will be in deep trouble. In this evening's topic, we are trying to understand the mechanism of fear. And fear is closely related to psychological time. To psychological time, not chronological time. So we have this topic, fear, time and the self. And we have taken the liberty to call these three the tentacles of error. For when there is error in seeing, which means there is no right seeing, there is no seeing correctly, seeing things as they are. The psychological mind in no time creates lots of imagined scenarios while actually they may not be true. The psychological mind is unable to be quiet. So there are tentacles of the octopus of the error. No wonder in Buddhism and in the Vedanta, they talk about samyak darshana, seeing rightly. 
the buddha is said to see things rightly the liberated while alive jivan mukta in vedanta is said to see rightly we don't know what begins and what follows is it seeing rightly that leads to mind becoming quiet or is a quiet mind the forerunner of seeing rightly probably we need not worry about what first and what later either way we are in need of a quiet mind we are in need of seeing rightly where there is no seeing rightly that is error erroneous seeing the western popular speaker and writer wayne dyer some decades ago had written a book your erroneous zones and it was very well received he was deeply touched by nisargadatta maharaj of bombay the author of the book i am that so when dyer called a book itself your erroneous zones many a time we have such imagination which persecutes us then we find that there was no basis at all for all that imagination even in small things we get tense we can really desperate like the other day it happened to me i was supposed to go to some house but morning after my breakfast i said oh my i don't want to go i am busy with so much work why did i agree that i would go to that house and and take a meal with this family ah oh, who and i tell you for about 20 minutes i really suffered but anyhow since i have great regard for that family who had invited me i wore a very fresh new shirt i wore a proper dress got ready and even a car came to take me to that place 45 minutes journey just before i could get into the car the other end called me and very politely they said do you mind if we cancel today's getting together i said oh i don't mind at all they had some difficulty some issue now i put the phone down and felt very relieved but what is of interest to us at this moment is for 20 to 30 minutes i was panting oh who will go oh this will make me lag behind in some more work all that is called psychological memory we slip from an objective evaluation of a scenario but we fancy what would happen to us the picture of my lagging behind in work was not a pleasant picture some other time the psychological mind might create a rosy picture ah oh, if this way i get profit in every dealing of mine in my new business within 5 years i will be a millionaire the mind imagines becoming richer and richer so i want to point out that psychological memory and the psychological functioning of thoughts is quite a crazy affair and our joys and sorrows are shaped by these psychological memories so we say is it possible for us to stay observant so observant that the mind does not misbehave it is pointed out 
by krishna ji that when you actually see the fact of some discomfort the fact of some injury the fact of some loss there is no fear at that time when after a couple of seconds the mind starts projecting scenes and scenes i lost this and if i keep losing like this day after day where will i be the mind's ability to project a dark picture for oneself is indeed quite a lot mind imagines both pleasant and unpleasant scenarios it's a very valuable insight in what i quoted so krishna ji is saying at the time of meeting something dangerous there is no fear it is a couple of seconds later that the mind constructs various possibilities i must now touch upon a proper or a valid doubt in this matter everybody would ask in this context how oh, does it mean we should not force the troubles coming our way does it mean we should not force the good things happening to us is it not a mark of intelligence for us to foresee what can happen in 10 days what can happen in 10 weeks what can happen in 10 years in some corporate interviews after looking at your profile your cv the interview panel asks you young man your cv is impress you and we find you already have a job in a certain company you want to join us now that is very good but tell me how do you see yourself after 5 years how do you see yourself after 10 years how do you see yourself after 20 years i have gone to one or two interviews like that long back and those days itself i was quite philosophical i somehow felt very uncomfortable with that question i said to them in one of the interviews i opened this sir sir i really don't worry about future and they didn't like that it seemed that you and i should be worried on one hand we should have ambition we should have a wondrous picture of where we want to reach aspiration ambition on the other we should be very very careful about possible failure or falling down from grace this is how the ordinary mind thinks so i want to touch upon this question does it mean that you have a blank and still mind a mind which is hardly working in the name of living in the present you do not intelligently see the possibilities in the future we say don't go to the extremes you can always you can always distinguish between baseless desires and true aspiration you can always distinguish between ambition and love of life love of your work love of people love of receiving friends and if that love drives you if that cheerfulness drives you with no particular thought about what you will become at the most those possibilities of where you will reach are in the back seat primarily you are not driven by what that whole proposal has in it for you what is in it for me is the first expression of a psychological mind 
somebody asks me somebody offers me something and my mind says oh he is asking me to come and spend 3 hours with him what is in it for me so this me raises its ugly head and somewhere else somebody makes a proposal my mind says this is how this guy has deceived many now he is trying to deceive me also so there is a lack of innocence lack of purity of mind when we go to the extent of judging everybody we go to the extent of looking at everything as the rise or fall of me brother first of all we have a picture of the me how good i am how rich i am how successful i am we measure this me we put a boundary around this me and once there is this measured i this measured evaluated i it is impossible to hold under check all the ramifications of thought so i would maintain that there is a state of intelligence where you do see prospects you do see certain things that can happen around you but the mark of that intelligence is that you have separated an objective assessment of what could happen from the subjective damage or good that could happen to this me to yourself so that is in one sense a mighty challenge but in this evening's topic that is the topic that is the challenge we are considering is it possible to be free of fear can the mind be quiet can the mind cooperate with our looking at situations without raising the psychological me can the mind be free of time again obviously it is psychological time one sees two years are left for this project to be completed one sees in 10 days those guests are coming whom i will have to receive them so two years 10 days <coughs> are chronological time but how come some of them create so much of hope and aspiration in us some others create fear and anxiety within us so we need to distinguish between an intelligent assessment of either the past or the future and the fancied downfall or great rise in our self worth should our self worth should our self esteem depend so much on things of the world in fact whether we try our best or do not things of the world are not in our control things of the world that is twists and turns in our life happen because of so many factors coming together by my deciding this is what i will become in next 3 years watch out and i say to others i say to myself i lift my hands what they call roll up my sleeves as they say you take some veer sankalpa all that okay you do all that and no one knows how future is going to unfold itself before covid began many people had many plans and lot of plans just went down the drain and some perhaps we benefited also but covid among other things has taught humanity a lesson that things are not fully in our control we have a role to play but things happen 
thanks to so many factors. Therefore, let me conclude saying, to be free from the tentacles of error, what is required is not decision, not resolve, not will. By saying, tomorrow onwards I am not going to fall a prey to either thought or to time or to the self, to fear. Tomorrow onwards I am not going to be afraid. Tomorrow onwards I am not going to be a victim in the hands of time or thought. By resolving like that, nothing will happen. But if we can see with the eyes of intelligence that the will is just a faint whisper in the whole scene, whole matter, what actually decides is beyond our limited intelligence. This recognition of our intelligence being limited leads to certain true humility. It doesn't depress us. It doesn't make us feel hopeless and useless. Oh, it seems nothing is in my hands. I just have to eat humble pie. I have to just say, well, that is my karma or something. No, that is a mistaken understanding of the operation of intelligence. When there is intelligence operating, one is rather blessed with humility. Earlier one was riding on a wave of, I decide everything, wave of egoism. And now seeing how so many factors are involved, what others do, what others don't do, etc., you become humble. Once more, not as a negative state of mind, but a certain humility that relieves you of unnecessary burden. So friends, we have a certain error, the opposite of intelligence. There is no intelligence, there will be error. In this state of error, things like the limited self, the separate self, fear and time arise. They do their dance, which can be very painful for us to watch, painful for us to go through. Thus, we would connect fear, time and the self and bring them all under the domain of error, lack of intelligence. Let me pause here and we request others to share their thoughts. Arishat sir. Arishat sir, you would like to comment or <coughs> say something? Uh, yes. Is my voice coming clear? Yes, sir. It is clear. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening, friends. Thank you, Swamiji, for opening up this topic on fear. Now, some fears we are born with, and they are kind of a instinct for survival. Like uh, when we are walking on a street, and uh, if some animals come or vehicle comes, we move away, and that is not a fear, but it is an instinct for survival. We don't go to fire, and uh, there is a fear of falling. It also comes from birth, and the fear of loud sounds also. So there are some fears are kind of instinct for survival, but we are talking about fears which come from thinking, imagining something, and uh, it is not true. Like you mentioned something about Samyak Darshan Vedanta and a quiet mind, 
So there is one analogy that if we want to look at the bottom of a lake, the water must be still, not moving. And also the water must be pure because if it is a dirty water, we can't look at the bottom. And if the water is very, very still and pure water, even if a bubble is coming from the bottom, we can see how this bubble is coming from the bottom and it is becoming bigger and then it bursts on the surface. So our mind is like that. If our mind is very silent and very pure, where no problem, then we can see the thoughts arising and how that thought creates not only fear, but sometimes when we are not looking, it can create um, all other problems like anger or jealousy or fear or desire. So all psychological problems, they are interrelated. Like if I am attached to some person and that person may be even far away, like in Mumbai or Bangalore, and some, something happens in Bangalore or Mumbai, some uh, explosion or fire, then I begin to worry about that person to whom I am attached. So it is an unnecessary kind of a fear, anxiety comes because I am attached to somebody. So attachment is related to fear. And I remember the fear I had also when I was attached to one person and uh, she had gone out in the city and did not come back for a long period. And I was worrying all kinds of thoughts, what happened because in that city, there were many black people and there was a lot of crime also in that city. So fear comes through thinking and thinking is kind of a imagination, unnecessary imagination. But I have also watched like when I'm walking like in Sayadri school on the periphery path and the path was going up and then suddenly the path was going down. And when I came on the top of the path and very few feet away, there was a black panther and it was enjoying the evening sun and the cool breeze was coming. And I looked at the panther and the panther looked at me and the panther went away. So when I looked at the panther, there was nothing. I was just looking as if I was looking at something, whether it is a flower or a tree. So in the same way, I looked and there was no fear. And after the panther went away, then thoughts begin to come about this panther. But at the moment of looking, there was no fear. Same thing happened in the Valley School, Bangalore, when I looked at the panther, uh, which was about um, 50 meters away. And we looked at each other for some few seconds. There was no fear. And the panther was going to the lake to drink water. It was the evening time. And I was going back to the study center and we both stopped and looked. And after a few seconds, the panther made a sound like hoof, 
and it went back. It did not go to the lake. And then I continued walking towards the study center and then thought came to my mind that I am going in the same direction in which the panther is going. So maybe I will see it again. So there was some kind of fear. So it is very clear that at the moment when we face a danger, there is no thinking. But when thinking comes, the fear comes. And same thing with, I have many experiences with snakes. I have looked at them. They have looked, there is no fear. It's wonderful to look uh, because they don't go after you, the snakes. But many people, when they look at the snakes, they get frightened, they run away. They think that the snakes will run after them, but snakes are also afraid of us. So it is very, very clear that fear comes through thinking. And sometimes thinking is necessary, but most of the time thinking is unnecessary and uh, it comes on its own. We don't have a control over thinking. Most of our thinking, it comes whether we like it or not. And if we don't look at this thinking clearly, then that thinking can create anxiety, fear, anger, jealousy, all our these problems are created because we are not fully awake to see what these thoughts are doing. So in the state of silent awareness, thinking thoughts may come and they can go away even one can do some imagination of Buddha or something, but it is just an imagination and we don't get carried away by that imagination. So important thing is to be alert and look at thoughts as they are unfolding and the thoughts, they come and they go away. They don't do anything. But when we are not looking, these thoughts multiply. And we, the sense of I comes from that. Uh, but in awareness, true awareness, which is not thinking, there is only looking, just observing, and there is no sense of I or me. And in such a state, we can look at a tree, we can look at an animal. Even when I looked at a kangaroo for the first time, it's so wonderful. And we can see everything new fresh in such a state of awareness in which there is no sense of I. Only when this awareness or intelligence is not there, then fear comes. And uh, then uh, we impart, when we get afraid of an animal, the animal also gets frightened. And then sometimes it may attack us. But otherwise, most of the animals, they don't do any harm. Even they are wild animals. So fear is the result of absence of nonverbal silent 
awareness. And this is what the teachings of Krishnamurti is about having effortless nonverbal awareness in which thoughts are seen clearly as they are and in such watching there is no illusion many illusions come only because there is no clear seeing and those illusions may create many problems in relationship just like if i am walking on a street and from the opposite end my friend is coming and my friend doesn't look at me i say hello to him but he doesn't say hello to me and he goes away and now what do i do if i am not very clear i will imagine that my friend has become my enemy or somebody has told my friend something against me and i can imagine all kinds of things and that may create many lot of disturbance in me but my friend did not respond to me because it could be that my friend was involved in his own imagination in his thinking and that's why he did not see me clearly so we create many problems of this psychological nature in human relationship because of not clear seeing and imagining a lot and in that kind of imagination without clear awareness there is this sense of me and that is the sense of self and you all that observer and the observed they are separate but in clear seeing there is only the observation there is neither the observer nor the observer ob- observed but clear observation in which things can happen life life can move very smoothly uh but that is the real challenge can we look like when we look at somebody many people when they look at me and they look at my this beard and they already imagine that i am a muslim and then they say salam alaikum or something like that but they don't know about me they already make imagination based on external appearance so to be free and to look at everything clearly whether it is nature or whether at, at human beings even at strangers how do we look and that is the real challenge in our life and that is what krishnamurti was talking about this choiceless awareness in which things and thoughts are seen clearly as they are and they have their own purpose but they don't create problem so i have said enough things and uh, i can say even one or two more things from my own experience in canada that once i was walking through waterloo park and it was a beautiful evening and uh, i was enjoying and then two canadian boys they looked at me 
and they started throwing stones at me. Because, and they began to abuse me by saying Paki and like that, because racism is very strong at that time in 1970s in Canada. But I was not afraid of these two boys. I went to them and I asked them why they were throwing stones. And then they asked me who I was. And I told them that I was at the university doing research in electrical engineering. And then they felt sorry. And then they went away. And similarly, in the apartment where I was staying in Canada, Waterloo, I was, I was on the terrace and looking at the sunset. And there was one Canadian on the ground in the neighborhood. And he was drunk. And he had a bottle, uh, empty bottle in his hand and he saw me and he raised the bottle in his hand to throw at me. And I looked at him without any thinking and then he got frightened and he said, are you going to call police? I said, no, I had no thoughts in my mind. And then he put away the bottle and he said, sorry. So when we look clearly, then we can avoid many, many problems which we create in our human relationship by unnecessary thinking. I'm not trying to say really trying a boasting about myself. But I learned how to look whether at nature or at my own thinking clearly after reading Krishnamurti's books in which he was saying that what we call I or me, the self, is coming from thinking. And once this thinking, the thinker comes, then it wants to change thought. And then it creates the duality between thinker and thought. And then all our psychological problems arise because of this duality between thinker and thought. And I was able to verify what Krishnamurti was saying by sitting silently and looking at my own thinking. And I found that thinking became very still. There was no thinking and there were no problems. So when there, there is no thinking, there is no thinker. There is no sense of I, then there are no problems. But generally, when people feel this sense of silence, of no thinking, they get frightened because it is like a death, psychological death. And so most people try to run away from their own self. And that's why many problems remain of the psychological nature. Uh, thank you. I have taken a lot of time. Uh, now, people who like to ask questions to Swamiji or to me, I, we will be very happy to uh, comment. Thank you very much. Also, if Chabra ji wishes to add something, we would invite him to do so. 
fine i think others may pitch in if anybody has any question or any comment or he wants to say something he has he should raise his hand so he can be unmuted and he can say sir, his uh, comment or question dinesh wagmare he has raised his hand yes yes please. are you able to hear to me sir yes yes yes, yes. sir my question to uh, both harshal sir as well as swami ji in my views thoughts only breeds the fear what is the basic cause yes perception of reality is one thing what is the perception suppose i am going in a jungle and i see the tiger i am alone then i will be frightened but see if i am going with the uh, forest officer lot of and with guns then i will not fear I have very fear so this perception clears also and uh, creates also the fear thought only breeds it thought makes it out of proportion suppose i am uh, i am having a fear of tiger that is fine but it's the same fear if i am having in front of a dog then it is out of proportion fear so that is that may be created because of the wrong uh, perception of the reality and uh, at the same time i am not having any uh, i have not seen the uh, actual uh, uh, reality of it or uh, truth of it rather so that is fine so thought is only breeding the uh, fear but i have to actually address uh, what uh, the actual cause is threat at any level suppose a physical level or a psychological level or an intellectual level or at the level of mind any sort of threat pursued by me will create a fear only the question is if it is out of proportion then i have to address it and another uh, aspect is if the that basic fear is because of my inadequacy to meet the situation suppose there is a uh, as swami ji said if i have to face a interview and i am not uh, well prepared then naturally i will be having the anxiety and the fear anxiety can be said to be pain in future and uh, fear is a pain in past I, any remembrance of the past instances creates the fear we can say it is a fear so basically thoughts is only uh, uh, breeding the fear my basic inadequacies or suppose if you talk of ego also ego means i i have got limited boundaries and i know i am having limited boundaries and i am having uh, uh, incapabilities or inadequacies then because of that that fear arises even krishna murti said if fear is a energy basically even sorrow and fear he said it's a, those are beautiful energies which, uh, which teach you or learn you uh, you make you to learn so basically uh, how to address uh, that basic energy that is my question and what are your views on my whatever i have said okay. question is to both for arshad sir as well as swami ji yeah swami ji you like to answer first not not necessarily you may say okay, okay. i will say a uh, thought brings fear because there is no that thing called awareness the choiceless awareness so when this awareness is there it can see the the beginning of a thought and from that thought comes the sense of i me which is different than the tiger and once this sense of i comes it, it feels insecure so there is a kind of uh, the basic problem is the lack of awareness i feel uh, and that is why when this thought comes uh, it brings the feeling of i me different than the tiger and then what will happen to me i i will die all that multiplies so i think the best response would be either <clears throat> you don't do anything look at the tiger or very quietly you move away but 
are no fear. Uh, fear may create the uh, fear in the tiger too, your fear, your vibrations. So I think the basic cause I would say is the lack of awareness. And uh, uh, that creates thinking and from thinking comes uh, fear and all that comes. Okay, I finish. So will you? Yeah, in your uh, sharing your thought, you mentioned an expression being adequately prepared or inadequately prepared. It seems to me that whether we are adequately prepared or inadequately prepared, if the basic issue of a erroneous perception is not resolved, the relief that we get by adequately preparing is of not much value. So this being opinionated about others, about ourselves, labeling others, labeling ourselves is a basic error. We do not accept others as they are, but we are unhappy about how they look at us. Some of these errors are very operative in our fear. Then, no matter how much we equip ourselves, like you gave the example of some forest department people coming with us with guns and so on. No doubt it's a temporary relief, but our mind will be prone to, will be subject to fear again and again. Whereas if the mind is freed, if it's freed from all prejudice, all fancy, that would be a true conquest of fear. Then you may take forest guards with you, uh, but apart from that, or more than that, essentially you will have a calm, compassionate mind. So while that point on being adequately prepared is on one hand appreciated, I think to be free of fear requires much more than being adequately prepared. Like in the example of the interview also, if somebody prepares very well, working hard for two days before the interview, that certainly will ensure his experience will be more pleasant. But in addition to some amount of decent preparation, if he sees things in a broader frame of reference, then he will be free of fear. He will even be ready to receive a rejection letter. He will just smile. He will find some other ways also to get going with life. He will not pin his so-called happy life with this particular job, this particular promotion. So we need something more than merely preparing adequately. We need a totally different outlook towards many goals of our life. Normally we take a goal and we panic. What if this goal is not reached? But on a higher level of intelligence, these goals come and go. No goal should hijack us. Goals come and go. And we should have a flexibility inside us to let go of a goal, however strongly we might have clung to it. We must be flexible enough to change our goal post and move on with life. This is what I may add. Pradeep Varmaji. Yes. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so many things are coming to my mind and I have to crystallize it into <clears throat> few things. 
to me, I am taking a holistic version of the whole thing. <clears throat> Life is largely psychosomatic. It is almost one whole. We lead most of our life with this whole, whole. Self is the center of fear that is there. Where does it start? Or rather, or rather when self starts, when? There is a continuity of centuries, gene into environment. There was a time when, when the DNA was discovered so genes, genes suddenly became very important, dominant. Then recently with the epigenetics coming in, suddenly environment became very important. So the whole that was divided into a gene-centric view, was little made complete through epigenetics, talking that unless until environment gives the right signal to genes, genes will not express. So we talk of whole and divide. You see, till today we are discussing body, mind and spirit we are struggling with these words. Now, this today's topic was also very interesting. I went into it quite deeply. The new word, what, what we are discussing is fear, time, self, and error. Then the tentacles, which is an extension of body. In this case, probably it is the extension of self. And tentacles are used for mostly by living, be living things, organisms, for grasping, moving, and feeling. So, and then who detects error? Who detects error? Mind. I'm talking with mind, talking to minds, I'm sure. So, Harshadji talked about instinct for survival. Initially, we have said because the mind is not, assuming that the mind is not so developed, so ultimately this must be through instinct and what I called as continuity of centuries. But this survival, sur instinct for survival, the survival word becomes larger and larger as we grow mind, body, spirit, whatever it is, because we have divided, so we discuss. So this life, this survival, for me, it is different. For Ambani's, it is different. For Tata's, it is different. For every, they also, for survival, they say it is for survival. So the survival takes a different meaning at different time. Now, how much is instinct? What is the role of uh, nature? Then we, we talk of opposites, opposite to intelligence. Something opposite to intelligence, I'm, I'm not able to understand. This whole, how this thing, and what divides? Opposite of intelligence, as if intelligence is not a whole, because cosmic order, I believe, is based on intelligence only. Compared to that human individual, as individual man, it is very, very, very limited. And that's why there are so many problems cropping up. So we have to take a holistic, rather than discussing and JK said, and we understand that word is not a thing, but every time we come up with new words, new knowledge, all this is a part of knowledge. 
and then suddenly we assume that there is some intelligence behind or rather which is different and when it works order is maintained order is created and all that so a lot of it we are imagining that if that person is looking for power prestige this and this this must be happening and so this psychology suddenly psychology has been separated from as if it's a different thing it's as if it is it for me it is a con, everything is so closely woven in life each cell has its own brain every cell when this when it is somatic because a different word has been given when it is psychological what is psyche all these things if it this for this is taken holistically probably one can understand in a better way than dividing into different words and how that fellow used that word and what you have understood and we have been discussing like this for for, for a number of years and uh, probably we are where we were what is awareness how it is different than uh, uh, what role knowledge has in awareness uh, like uh, dr uh, as harsha ji said instinct so awareness is also right from the very beginning every life has awareness even the smallest yeah. please yeah may i respond please. to that say uh, yeah. the instinct the instinct uh, or survival is survival of the body and uh, that is necessary body but our problems are that we want this self ego to survive and uh, that is because that awareness or intelligence is not awakened and uh, you are talking about awareness which is a primary awareness which every animal also has but we are talking about awareness the intelligence which can see how the problems of psychological nature are coming into existence through thinking so the kind of awareness which krishna ji is talking about is not the primary awareness which children and uh, animals and birds have but something which is beyond intellect so we are born with instinct then we develop intellect as uh, as we study in schools and college we become very good at logic and discussing but this intelligence or awareness is different is higher than intellect and with that awareness intellect can function properly in a proper way but without this intelligence or awareness which krishna ji talks about without that the intellect will be very destructive and that is what has happened in the world is that people have developed intellect but that intelligence is not has not come that awareness choiceless awareness which krishna ji is talking about so the real our uh, discussion which we we are using lots of words and ideas but the actual thing is non verbal and that has to happen when we are really face with the problem so how do we face any problem and the problem will come suddenly it, it, it will not announce like somebody inserted you and you were not expecting you thought he was a very good friend and he started insert, inserting you at that time how do you listen to that insult and if you can listen very very with a quiet mind uh, giving full attention to what that criticism is and then you look inward and have the space to find out whether what that person 
is saying is true or false, then you don't create problems, further problems. But if you have this image that you are somebody very intelligent and good looking and somebody says, you are not, you are stupid, and you react very violent, violently, that is a proof that you are not intelligent. So how do we listen? How do we look? And how do we do anything? That is what the real awareness is, the awareness of thinking as it is arising. What Krishnaji calls reading the book of life, our own life. And this book is being written every day, every moment. So are we able to look at everything that is arising in our mind? And to look clearly, it requires this intelligence or awareness, which Krishnaji is talking about. OK, I have finished. Yes, sir. Uh, due to low bandwidth here, I'm only on audio. Uh, I have often noticed that in the moments of boredom or some disturbance, if I'm escaping into pleasant memories or imagination, later on, a sense of glooming fear erupts which seemingly doesn't have any apparent reason. If I don't run away from my inner disturbance or boredom, this type of causeless fear doesn't occur later on. So it seems that some sort of inner tolerance or titiksha is demanded by life, but we are left free to choose our course. Thank you, sir. Can I ask something here? Yes. Yeah. So Harshad sir and uh, Shakti sir both are saying, uh, uh, are they saying that we have to do advanced preparation for awakening of intelligence and uh, we, have to, we have to be more aware, then only we can face it, such situation? What I would say that one needs a curiosity to look inward and see why, if, they, if anger came, what is behind it? Why, why did I get angry? So generally, our mind is trained to solve the problems, like environmental problem, planting trees and all that, uh, and engineering, science problems. Our mind is trained to deal with the world which is outside, to make our life more comfortable. But when we become curious to look inward, like if I get disturbed, what is behind this disturbance? I want to really go at the root of fear or jealousy or anger. Then what can learn directly uh, not one doesn't need to read Krishnamurti again and again. Maybe a little bit reading is necessary, but then we have to experiment it in our own life. And when we begin to see clearly our own mind, then we don't need to do anything. We can learn the way Krishnamurti learned about himself, we, any human being, can learn. What is required is curiosity, that I really want to find out why I get angry, why I get disturbed. Is it possible to be free, you know, and to look without images at human beings or nature? So when such thing becomes very important in one's life, then it goes very well. Naturally, it goes. One doesn't need to struggle so much, I feel. OK, finish.
प्रदीप वर्मा जी वर्मा सर तो आज समथिंग यस सर हर्षद जी जस्ट टॉक्ड अबाउट क्यूरियोसिटी क्यूरियोसिटी इज द प्रॉपर्टी ऑफ माइंड इज इंट इट टेल मी वेदर इट इज इट इज नॉट इट इज सर वर्मा जी आई लाइक टू इंटरप्ट इट इज नॉट द property of the mind it is the instinct basic basic instinct of curiosity in one self it is not a what, property of mind who who but what told you that it is that and not this is mind my mind, mind is not operating sir at that level so you can ask your question to harsha sir and then no, harsha ji whether her curiosity yeah. is is the curiosity whether mind has any role in curiosity modak says no hmm yeah <clears throat> what i am saying is we ask many questions about the world outside but have we really ask what is anger what is boredom what is behind it what created the boredom and such questions when it is not a intellectual question but a real question then the mind becomes very silent to look inward so that is uh, not taught in schools that why we create problems for ourselves it's not necessary to create many many problems which are creating for ourselves because we have not looked inward and that's why there is so much crime corruption people want more and more but they don't ask what is 1 crore then somebody wants 10 crores what will they do with the money and the is do we really need so much money to live a happy life or the basic necessities we need you know so this kind of questions uh, mm -hmm. are not there in human beings and that kind of curiosity you know but curiosity brought so many answers isn't it isn't it initial questions we put questions when we really say that we don't know then only we ask a question that's a genuine question when i don't know and when then no this don't know business is a silent mind because mind is not put giving us any uh, input that's why we, we are very sure that we don't know anything about this that's a genuine question isn't it and we do get answers also it's not that the question remains question yeah <clears throat> yes in silence you can see everything uh, when the question is very genuine like uh, when i read krishnamurthy saying that thought creates the thinker the sense of i then i said is it really so let me look and when i looked the mind became silent the question may come from the mind but to look something else required than this thinking mind and that is the real uh, uh, curiosity what i call to look without thinking and then we can see the thinking arising clearly and if it is creating problem we can see it is creating problem but we can avoid uh, this thoughts creating fear or anger or jealousy if we see it clearly from not the thinking mind and that is what awareness what krishna ji is talking about so that is our difficulty if you have to say something sir yeah yes sir मैं थोड़ी माफी चाहूंगा हिंदी में बोलूंगा ये ये जो क्यूरियोसिटी की बात आई है ना इसके ऊपर मैं कुछ कहना चाह रहा हूँ दरअसल हिंदी में 
दो शब्द हैं कौतूहल और उत्सुकता अब वो जो कौतूहल होता है वो बड़ा बस आधे मिनट के लिए होता है बस निकल जाता है उत्सुकता थोड़ी और देर ठहरी रहती है और उत्सुकता के जिज्ञासा बनने के चांसेस होते हैं और वो भी गायब हो सकती है तो मुझे लगता है कि यू सी अवर इंक्वायरी इज इट बीइंग इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय सम सॉर्ट ऑफ सीरियस डिस्कोर्स देन इट इवेपोरेट्स बट इफ इट गेट्स कनेक्टेड समवेयर विद अवर यू नो इनर लाइफ विद अवर डेली लाइफ देन परहेप्स इट कैन बिकम अ क्यूरियोसिटी Uh, which is uh, more of an instinct than one passing fad just that i want it was just one my my, my idea thank you yes yes can i thank say you. something yes yes, yes you can yeah bolo bolo mujhe yahi lagta hai maybe hindi mein baat karna chahunga to baat kar le zarur mujhe bhi yahi lagta hai ki jo shakti ji bol rahe sahi hai hamare matlab agar shastron ki baat kare to usme bhi jiggyasa word aata hai जो कि गहरी चीज है जिसको कि कृष्ण मूर्ति इंक्वायरी बोल रहे हैं तो अथा तो धर्म जिज्ञासा या अथा तो ब्रह्म जिज्ञासा ये सब चीजें हमारे स्क्रिप्चर से आई हुई है और ये मेनली इंस्टिंग से आ रही है मतलब आदमी की इंस्टिंग होगी तो ही वो उसके अंदर उस टाइप की रियल जिज्ञासा जो है होगी थॉट जो है ये एक्चुअली थॉट इज आफ्टर वर्ड सॉर्ट ऑफ थिंग और कंडीशन कंडीशनिंग बेसिकली but that that is developed on the instinct that's what i feel what harshad sir has to say on this yeah <clears throat> if you ask a question like what is thought how will you answer it so thought is basically made up of uh, words and the, the words uh, shows a particular uh, way of thinking of a person and uh, that is actually generated by his instinct only suppose he i am having a curiosity or interest in some particular field say engineering then i will mm-hmm. having the thoughts of engineering if i am having a interest or jiggyasa in particular field then i will having the thoughts of in that particular field yes but you are answering from the knowledge you have gathered but when the question is asked can you look without giving any answer can you just look at the question itself so what what for uh, we are looking we are looking for answer only isn't because, it because no when you give the answer that means uh, it's a normal thing question answer it will not change your life at the deeper level you may get all the answers all the no, knowledge you can get i understand but what you are Yeah. I understand, yeah. sir, what you are saying about the choiceless awareness. I understand, yeah. but uh, that is okay when you are sitting still and you are having a quiet mind. That is okay, fine. But when you go into relationship, you have to move. In, you move in the world. Then there are different kind of threats. At that time, uh, of course, if you have worked earlier, then you can remain quiet and uh, the, handle the situation. But otherwise, yeah. uh, how how you will uh, uh, attend that threat? so you know you use the word relationship so a person who is curious in the way i am talking about will ask what is relationship what is the basis of such a relationship is it based on getting something out of somebody like that is what kind of questions which krishna ji was asking so we are not asking the fundamental questions and then those fundamental questions one can answer from knowledge but such answers has no meaning it's just a, something you can read it in a book and uh, it won't change but when you begin to look without trying to find answer just looking at the question itself then your mind may stop also and then that is the learning moment i think a uh, a direct learning happens in looking without thinking 
And that is what is lacking in our life, I think. We know so much, like Kabir said, Othi padi padi pandit hua, pandit hua na koi. So one can gather a lot of knowledge, but as long as there is no experimentation of it in our daily life of relationship, then such knowledge becomes a burden. And also Krishna Ji says, knowledge, thinking, cannot solve our problem. Thinking is creating many, many problems which we are not able to see clearly because that intelligence or awareness is not awakened in us. So as long as that has not happened, thinking will create problem in relationship and uh, there is a deterioration goes on in our life as we grow older, our problems will multiply. But when this different way of looking comes, then though your body becomes old, but your mind will remain fresh, inquiring, looking, not trying to find an answer. Answer one can get, but that will have no meaning. Only looking. And that is the beauty in life is to look at nature, at human beings with full awareness and seeing it as if you are looking for the first time. So in that you see a lot of beauty and freshness. So that is why we are, or uh, that is why Krishna Ji was talking to children, adults, intellectual people, everybody saying that there is a different way of looking at everything. And that way is choiceless awareness or intelligence without knowledge which we have gathered from the past. Okay, I will finish. Beautifully said, uh, Harshad ji said beautifully. I will just complete it. Kothi Padapad Jagmua Pandit Bhayana Koe Dhai Akhar Prem Ka Pade So Pandit Hoi. So ultimately, yes. it ends up with JK. JK emphasized if love is there, no conflicts, no problems, nothing going. Abir said it in two lines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we close? Time is up. Yeah. One seven thirty. Yeah. Can we close, sir? Thank you. Thanks Thank you. For all for you